welcome to the Theology Podcast. Great to have you here for this show. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest. I've written some books. My latest book is In the House of Tom Bombadil. And I'll be back in a moment because I have the topic for the day, but uh, let's hear from Glenn and Tom. Glenn. Glenn Sunshine, Senior Fellow at the Carlson Center for Christian Worldview, uh, Ministry Associated Reflections Ministries, retired and recovering history professor. Um, and I actually just sent the first draft of my next book into my publisher. All right. More on that later. Okay, great, <laughs> great. Tom. Tom Price. I teach uh, Christian ethics, uh, systematic theology, philosophy. One of the places is Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Okay. Well, today, the subject of the day is, is, is this. Can public education be saved? No. Okay. End of show. <laughs> what got me thinking about what got me thinking about this topic? I was originally intending to talk about something else, but uh, I read an article today uh, in the latest issue of First Things. This is the June July two thousand and twenty three issue. So it's, I don't think it, uh, everyone has it yet. I'm one of the fortunate few, I think, who got it got it early. Uh, but the title of the article is entitled Don't Spare the Rod. Don't Spare the Rod. And this is by uh, a fellow named Daniel Buck, who is a senior visiting fellow at the Fordham Institute, but also apparently a high school teacher. Uh, we're not told where he teaches. We don't have the name of the school, um, but it's clearly a public school. And in the uh, description of the situation that he finds himself in, it's like something out of like Blackboard Jungle in like the 1960s or 70s or 80s or 90s. You get the drift. It's been bad for a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what we have uh, is a, a description of the breakdown of order in education, public education. Now, that's not to imply that things have been orderly, um, you know, I think all three of us are publicly educated. Am I right? Yeah, we yeah. all went to public school. Yeah. And I'm sure we all have horror stories and things that we could tell. In fact, I'll, I'll spend a little time talking about my own experience <laughs> in a minute. But, you know, we're, we're part of a, you know, a circle of people who I think uh, know all of this kind of almost by, you know, in their gut, even if they've not been involved in public education and have instead opted for other forms of uh, education. You know, homeschooling, obviously, is very popular, I think, with a number of people in our audience. Um, I think uh, classical Christian schools uh, or even more conventional Christian schools uh, are, you know, uh, you know, schools of choice for many people in our listening audience. There are, I'm sure, folks out there who maybe for one reason or another can't avail themselves of either one of those options and do send their kids to public school. But I, I, I get the, I have the sense that the, that uh, our numbers probably skew toward those other two, you know, public education, I mean, not, not public, but, uh, you know, Christian education, either in a uh, formal setting or homeschooling. So um, this article describes a kind of uh, decay that he ties to some more recent developments with kind of the rise of the sort of the, the woke wave that swept over the country following the uh, problems uh, that came out of uh, Minneapolis and the George Floyd uh, death. And he starts off with a, uh, you know, a statement concerning his own, his own work as a, as, as a teacher. He says, uh, I teach in the most crime ridden neighborhood in my city. I am not the best teacher in the building. They won't make any Hollywood movies about me, <laughs> uh, but I am a good one. One administrator described my classes as a Jekyll and Hyde affair. There are may be utter chaos elsewhere, but when my students enter my room, they will spend the hour reading aloud, finishing essays, and discussing whatever is on the table that day. Now, my guess is that because he's a man and because he's uh, clearly a uh, self-conscious conservative, he wouldn't be publishing first things if he wasn't. He has some advantages in that setting. And I can relate to those advantages. I, I've, I've been in similar settings, uh, you know, both as a teacher, but uh, 
also as a, an urban minister and a guy who was involved in urban youth ministry for years. And when you have the confidence that your convictions provide you with to project authority in those settings, you can master those, even those chaotic settings and uh, develop a kind of uh, environment in which is conducive to learning. You know, I've seen it done. I've done it. But when you don't have those convictions, when you are a person who maybe uh, questions whether or not you even have authority uh, and assume that uh, the projection of authority is even questionably uh, uh, justifiable uh, or maybe even wrong, then you're going to have chaos <laughs> in those settings. Uh, anyway, so he describes chaos. He talks about a, a, a a couple of girls who bully another girl, uh, she, they come into his classroom chanting googly, googly, googly at this new girl who apparently has googly eyes. And uh, long and short, um, he tries to um, apply some discipline, calls in the administrators. They just simply uh, provide, you know, listen to the, the these uh, tormentors and then send them back to his classroom with no with no consequences for their behavior. Um, the uh, other students in the room obviously are unhappy about any you know all of this, but the failure of the you know the folks uh, at the top uh, when it came to doing something in terms of punishment uh, leads to. Uh, this girl who's been tormented just simply leaving that school. She apparently, you know, has the has parents or, or guardians that are able to get her some, you know, someplace else. But the long and short of it is this: this is a situation that appears to be going from bad to worse, not just in his school, but more broadly speaking. And again, it has to do with this crisis of confidence when it comes to a, to authority. Uh, and the application of standards, you know, just basic standards of, you know, uh, good conduct in a school environment. So this is the situation. So I don't know if you guys have anything that you want to jump on here with regard to the article. I know you've, you've read it and uh, you might have some thoughts that could get us moving in some different directions on this subject. Um, I mean, I think a good place uh, to kind of well, a good angle to look at it is is really the 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 failing trust and the failing benefit of institutions, um, and, and in particular educational institutions, in which their core function has been pretty much eradicated or redefined so much that it it's instrumental to something else, whether it's political advantage, social advantage of a of a you know, the political, the, the elite political class or the oligarchs or whatever. Um, but just on the, on the everyday level, here are people, especially in, in more challenging life situations and chaos, in which education could be one of those driving vehicles to give them something to actually steer their way through it and, and come out in a better place. The exact opposite is happening. You know, so here is now this is where kind of the institution and its moral integrity, which is the only thing that could give it any authority. Right. If 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 students don't think that it has something good for the student in the long run, but is an authority to subvert or to to rebel against, um, then you already have a basic competition involved in the schooling between teachers, administrations and students that is guts any attempt to be able to educate everything's everything's been ripped out of it and so i mean i think what you're looking at and this is just one example of many examples of the differing institutions that have lost their they, they don't they've lost the understanding of their you know their historic mission um but also the common good and, and good ends for the students to be educated and elevated yeah, yeah. Now, Glenn, you you sent us a, a link to a Twitter account, which described a really horrific incident down in Texas, of all places, that takes this particular bullying, you know, problem 
described here in this article to a whole other level. Do you, do you mind uh, describing it? Yeah. Um, first grade girl comes home, has a radical change in behavior. Um, parents are concerned. They start asking the girl what's going on. She's kind of reluctant to tell them, but eventually it comes out that she was sexually assaulted by another first grader in her classroom while another boy there filmed it on a school iPad while the teacher was in the room. And I I mean, I'm not going to go into the details, but it was a serious sexual assault. It's the kind of thing that would get you charged with rape elsewhere. Right, right. The school covered it up. The school board covered it up. There were no consequences for anyone. And they're doing, you know, they're they're organizing protests and things like that. But the school basically threatened, well, the school board threatened to fire any teacher who spoke to anybody about it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the kind of behavior that I think demonstrates that the schools uh, are have lost touch not just with the institutional mission that you noted, as you noted, Tom, but yeah. have been actually been taken over by kind of a criminal element uh, yeah. where um, you know the truth and justice are not uh, the foremost concerns apart from education, but just the the advancement of particular interests. Yeah, uh, and you know, in this particular in this particular case, um, the the sense that I had from what I read, uh, it, it, what occurred down in Texas, seemed like it could have been an interracial kind of thing. Uh, but then there's just simply the self interest of teachers and administrators, people who don't want bad publicity, people who don't want um, things that might harm uh, their own vocational or professional. Uh, advancement to to come to light, you know that kind of stuff. Of course, that's stuff that you see all over the place. But I think we're seeing it in in uh, more significant uh, degrees t- today, uh, and it, it has something to do with the fact that we're in a situation where um, naked interest is now um, more or less assumed to be legitimate. And the notion that there are uh, standards that are true for everyone is called into question. You know, Um, standards can only be understood as being the interests of a particular group being imposed on other groups. So, and and I I think that that's actually a key here because. Th- this whole thing is part of a broader ideological issue that's yeah. going on in the schools. You can't yeah. you can't just look at this and say it's it, it's chaos. It's you know it's it's purely self interest or anything like that. That's part of it certainly, but the ideological orientation that mm-hmm. is that has taken over public education that's taken over the uh, the academy that's taken over the people who train teachers and especially mm-hmm. principals all of those yeah. kinds of things uh, are also in play here and i think that w- without looking at those kinds of issues you can't really understand the problems that are going on um on in the schools uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're exactly right. I mean, you, if you look at the you look at the kind of indoctrination that goes on in in the university for both in the field of psychology, which a lot of classes the education students have to take, but also education. It is filled with agendas. We've listed and covered a lot of them, but equity in particular, understood in a peculiar way. And also the quote unquote queering of social norms, because that is the real enemy to that ideology is the social world's set of norms that children are being brought up in, especially if they are, they maintain kind of the established American social order, for example, or it's historical. So they see that as an illegitimate structure. So their task is basically to exercise the processes of education, not just what they're teaching them, in a way 
that affirms that commitment. And so affirming students, even in their, you know, antisocial, if not sociopathic behavior, is seen as basically a step in the right direction because it's kind of punishing the social norms that they want in a way to be subverted or uprooted and transformed. And they need that kind of that yeah. flipping of authority, if you will, to, to carry it out. Yeah. There are two sides to this. You know, there's, there's uh, the, the critical theory side to this, uh, which doesn't seem to have any real program to replace what it seems to think is the problem. <laughs> it's a death word. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a death work. It's just get things out of the way and, and yeah. just let chaos, you know, follow. But the other part of it is um, an understanding of human nature that's at work here that the uh, author of this particular article uh, traces back to your favorite uh, thinker. <laughs> yes, I uh, noticed he mentioned Rousseau. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let me read this here. <laughs> he says, uh, this philosophy has its source in the works of educational romantics such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Mm-hmm. The opening line of Rousseau's The Social Contract is, quote, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains, end of quote, beautifully summarizes this view. Human beings, and children in particular, are free of original sin, born perfect, full of unbridled potential. Society and its fussy norms can uh, corrupt us. The ideal education, then, removes children from society, from social norms, from the control and direction of authorities and yeah. allows them to follow their inborn goodness. Quote, mm. the first impulses of nature are always right. End of quote. Rousseau <laughs> writes in Emile. Can I remind uh, everyone that Rousseau fathered three children out of wedlock and abandoned every one of them? Yeah, he has yeah. very little experience raising children. No, yeah, that's right. He doesn't. In fact, I think that he doesn't want to raise children precisely because his theories would be uh, subverted. <laughs> then he goes on to say, uh, quote, this is again Rousseau, there is no original sin in the human heart. So, you know, when, when, when Christians criticize public education, and there are many reasons to criticize, but they tend to focus on uh, the end uh, of education, which is... It should be, uh, you know, uh, oriented toward the glory of God. And consequently, you know, because public education doesn't have such an end, it's, mm -hmm. it's not something that truly educates in the way we should be educated anyway. It's not discipleship. And, that's a, and that, I think that's a very legitimate criticism. Or if they, they focus on um, a, an approach to knowledge, which doesn't seem to have any connection to virtue uh, or to revelation or even reason in some cases. Uh, and, you know, classic example would be, say, you know, Darwinism. Um, but they, I think one of the things that gets overlooked in the Christian critique is what this guy is bringing to the surface here. We believe that human beings, um, because they're bent toward sin, need to be corrected. In other words, we're not dealing with just, you know, a blank slate, uh, you know, as Locke would have it, or, or, and we're not dealing with just, um, you know, pure goodness, as Rousseau tells us, we're dealing with uh, bent timber. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, the, another thing, to, just to bring critical theory back in here, one of the things that has uh, been promoted lately, um, at least I've, I've only run across it lately, I suspect it goes back quite a ways, is that the idea of civility, uh, politeness, all of that kind of thing, uh, those are characteristics of whiteness and white supremacy. Yeah. So when um, when someone acts out like the girls in, in your story, um, they're, they're just, uh, they're doing something virtuous. Yeah. You know, that's really ultimately what it comes down to if you follow through on the logic of, of that claim. Yeah, right. that's... Right. That's the kind of, the, again, the, the labeling what have been norms as something bad and then seeing themselves as liberating them in their rebellion um, to reject them. And, and, so, and, and in a way, ordering the society to accept what we would otherwise consider aberrant or uncivilized <laughs> behavior. And again, this, this is very much in that Rousseau camp that that. They want to take what has been kind of established norms. They're not weighing any of its goodness 
or badness really other than it's just uh, it's just bad um and so that's the, the the only kind of sin that they'll admit to is basically the sin of having some kind of imposed social order that people didn't have a the pure freedom to opt into right um uh, and that volitional element and so so that automatically makes it uh, you know unequitable and unjust and and then then you also have from that Rousseau vision, um, a suspicion, therefore, of anyone who tries to advance civilization in any way, because it is always looked at, unless it's affirming their kind of, you know, self-affirming identity or whatever, as against them. As And, and it isn't about, like you said, like we were saying, it isn't about the orientation of the good, um, whether it's taking our desires, which can tend toward the bad and, you know, helping us bring them under control and, and and foster healthy ways of of um, you know exercising our our will and our our desires, um, or it's same with knowledge, taking what we learn and not using it to you know develop criminal enterprises, for, you know, which can be deadly and destructive, but actually advancing something that benefits our you know our families, ourselves in the long run, and and society, and ultimately our soul. Yeah, there are a couple of things here that, that come to my mind when I think about the kind of the dilemma that we're uh, dealing with. This particular treatment, for all of, that it has going for it, uh, doesn't have any uh, reference to the family life of the kids that are coming into the schools. So um, having, you know, raised kids, having myself been the product of a broken home, having grown up in housing projects, spent time, uh, in foster care, been a ward of the state myself, been in very tough neighborhoods and having gone to tough schools as a kid. Um, you know, I know firsthand that my kids had a far better, uh, not just educational experience, but support system that, to help them, uh, achieve educational goals than I had. So, uh, I come from an odd background that I, you know, I've referred to it before, but it's a, it's a, my parents, uh, were part of the me generation and they were seeking, you know, looking for themselves, trying to actualize themselves. And the notion that, you know, they were laboring under was that, uh, your duties shouldn't define you. They're kind of, they, they were kind of propelled by a kind of Rousseauian outlook mm -hmm. that there was, basically just this sort of thing that would just sort of flower or sort of bloom from within <laughs> you'd, you'd find your bliss by pursuing your, your, you know, your, your impulses or whatever. And I, I always joke that, you know, when people were looking for themselves, the self that they were looking for always seemed to be in California, very far away from the responsibilities. <laughs> and, and that's where they would, they would run. They would just run away from their responsibilities. And there were people who were left behind and there were people who uh, were left to their own devices. And so from the time I was about, you know, you know, I, I, this is all very, it all depends on how you, you sort of say that the line was crossed. But I, from the time I was like seven, eight years old, I was largely on my own, even though my parents were still around. And I could tell you just horrific stories uh, about my childhood. I just don't do it because I just don't like going there. And I can tell you that uh, I, I despised public education uh, as a, as someone who was subjected to it, uh, not just because I was in terrible schools, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but because I, I didn't have the kind of uh, parental support system in place that would help me to succeed uh, and encourage success. And you know, and I joke, I, I hated eighth grade so much I took it twice. <laughs> and, and there are, there are so many different things that it, and, you know, I was dealing with, uh, physical confrontations and all, and, and authorities that I couldn't trust and who were basically, um, uh, you know, uh, people that you couldn't turn to, to find real help. Even when, even in those days in the late sixties and early seventies, it's not like this is entirely new. Yeah. Um, but I would say in those days that there, the, there wasn't quite as much momentum behind the insanity. And there were still people in the system who were, who were informed by Christian truth. And that's not the case as far as I can see in most public education. Now I'm looking at it from the outside, I admit, and I have friends who are public school teachers who are strong believers and are doing their best uh, in, yeah. in those settings. But 
they're on their, you know, in their own words, uh, you know, like islands in the storm. Um, yeah, well, there, and there's a lot. I mean, I, the last statistics I've heard, the dropout rate of teachers leaving the, the field is astronomical. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, when you look at what they have to basically are pressured to promote, you can see, you can see why. But it's interesting you talk about something in that, you know, and and, and especially the, the kind of – support system when we talk about that is a lot of the cases where you have the more challenging school public school systems and education where education would probably be one of the strongest support should be one of the strongest supports is actually where it's just mimicking the surrounding um, especially with the broken families and, and a lot of socioeconomically hurt places um, and it's not only there. I mean, they're broken families across the board now. But it, in terms of having less supports and needing more traditionally institutional helps, all of which, again, have have c- cannot make up for what the family, uh, a loving uh, but ordered uh, family, can supply. And and, and so. What do they do there um, now that they a lot of these families have, you know, you have children who, like you say, can sometimes pretty much raising themselves because they just live with mom or they live with their aunt or grandmother. And they, you know, grandma or mom has to go, go, you know, do some work. And well, yeah, that, that's that's something I'd like to get into. So, you yeah. know, the, well, the title I, of the show. Go ahead. Don. Actually, before we get there, I'd like to point out yet another problem um, that was really brought to the fore in the Texas case we talked about. Um, and that is the ubiquity of pornography. Yes. Uh, which, you know, uh, kids bringing in their their iPads or their laptops or whatever to school, my guess is a lot of them are, you know, watching porn on, the, on those things rather than paying attention to classes. And then yeah. add to that, well, where does a five-year-old get the idea of sexually assaulting a classmate. Oh, I agree. Yeah. It's the, probably the home life of that six year old, yeah. of that six year old kid is horrific, uh, either completely unsupervised or the people who do have supervision are untrustworthy and themselves, uh, subject to, you know, these, uh, addictions from porn addiction or whatever. And so there's probably just a lot of stuff, uh, in that setting, that kid's setting that could be, you know, a um, inspiration, if that's the right word, for that kind of behavior. Yeah, and, and the, the hypersexualization of children, which oh, is yeah. coming now we're hearing out of, yeah. uh, you know, out yeah. of Europe, a lot, a, lot, a lot of it. But it's also the drag story, drag story hour. All, all of this, all of this is, is just creating yeah. conditions for extreme consequences especially on young girls more more than anything yeah yeah across the board yeah when 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 it comes to this uh chaos another thing that is awfully frustrating to deal with is the virtue signaling of the elites so uh elites you know i so because of my background i come from a fairly elite kind of family situation which oddly uh you know, also kind of coexisted with this kind of experience with the underclass. <laughs> and then I spent time in Cambridge uh, and while there worked with the underclass and spent time at Harvard. And so I, I, I've have, I have kind of a, a range that's unusual in terms of personal uh, experience. And so often what you have is people who um, will – say things that and support policies which are really not in the interest of 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 poor people but make the elite person who professes them look good and then when it comes to their own kids well of course their kids are you know in in enrolled in super elite exclusive private schools Mm -hmm. um now now that world can be a mess too but for yeah. you know, but um, yeah. but it, you get what I'm getting at. There's a there's kind of duplicity here that's really maddening um, with these people, and 
you know, how do we deal with all this stuff? So you brought up something, Tom, that I think I'd like to reflect on a little bit. So I'm a hundred percent behind, um, private schooling in both in the, you know, classical Christian, uh, school environment and in the homeschooling environment. If I had had the option to, 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 uh, jump out of public education and go into, the, into either one of those worlds, I would have done it in a heartbeat. <laughs> it just, just wasn't an option for me, but that's the point. There are a lot of kids who maybe are, you know, the children of a single mother who's have you know, has to work all the time or even, you know, worse, uh, just find themselves in this environment where they don't even have parents who are capable of ordering their own lives, let alone helping their kids, if you get my drift. And they're, and they're in these schools. They're in these public schools. So we could be purists and say, we should just shut down the Department of uh, edu- you know, education. Maybe we should do that. Yeah. But I'm, I guess the thought I, I'm getting at is, is we're probably going to have public schools for the foreseeable future. You know, uh, there's just, uh, a lot of kids out there that have no place else to go unless, yeah. you know, the church opens up schools and finds ways of finding them to just take on hundreds, if not thousands of kids yeah. in a particular and you know, community. Now that could happen. Uh, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen, but it's, I'm just saying it's unlikely to happen. It's not around the near, it's not around <laughs> the corner. <laughs> right, right. So what should, what should our uh, approach to these institutions be? So I, I'd like to suggest something. First of all, I know that a lot of our listeners, because their kids aren't in uh, public schools, don't feel like they have a, actually have a right to address those problems. Uh, and they probably would find that many of their secular neighbors would agree. But I'm, I beg to differ. <laughs> and there are two good reasons why. First of all, these are public institutions. And as citizens, we have the right to address institutions that have been established by our government. And if we find that they are actually undermining the health of our communities and the health of the people who are in them and subject to their services, we have the right, not just the right, but the duty to call them to account. Yeah, it's it's worth noting that the big argument against school vouchers and things like that is that it takes money away from public education and public education is a public good. It's good for the country. And so even if you don't have kids in the school or you choose to send them somewhere else, your tax dollars still need to go to support those schools. Well, if well, that's the case, if that's the case, <laughs> then you also have a right to say what's going on in those schools. Well, I, yeah, I agree. That was my second point. I didn't got to it yet, but, but I was the reason why I started with the first one is because even with the voucher situation, you still have a right. So if there are rotten schools that are being supported uh, and, and uh, by you know the, the, the government, uh, whether your tax dollars go directly to them or not, they are being supported by the political system that you are a part of, that you participate in through elections uh, and so forth. Now, unless we're, we've really, you know, you know, you know, uh, gone belly up and just said, and have said to our, you know, our, 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 you know, ruling authorities, um, you can do whatever you want, just leave me alone. Then um, we have a right and a duty to mm-hmm. to address the what what is being uh, done in our in our institutions, and that includes institutions that have been established to teach children. So, so my point is, is that let's say you you're homeschooling your kids and you're renting so you're not even paying any a dime you know uh (laughs) directly because that's usually where the funds come from uh to support public schools is through tax dollars on residential housing um but you still have a right as a citizen to speak to it and you should and you should shouldn't be at all in, sort of uh, inhibited when it comes to attending school board meetings or anything, even if you don't have any kids at all. Yeah, um, and pushing, pushing to, to be able to view the curriculum, yeah. the sources use, what children are learning. Right. I mean, you're, you're impacted by what those children learn <laughs> as, right. as someone part of that social, social um, you know, set of social relationships. Yeah, and we know how 
uh, the cult of expertise works. The cult of expertise oftentimes is intended to, to act, actually obfuscate and prevent people from looking beneath the surface yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's really not that complicated most of the time. Most of the time, someone with just some basic common sense can see through the nonsense. Yeah. Well, that, and I think that that's another, you know, disturbing trend, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, as some generations shift is this notion that only only experts or qualified holders of office are competent enough to, you know, to understand, evaluate or be able to see um, what the curriculum is. This whole notion now that sort of teachers and educators know what's better for your children to learn than than parents do, as though parents are just, you know, a bunch of rubes who have the inability to to do anything. Usually, because it, it cuts against the the grain of of their you know ethical vision. Um, I mean, that's, that's usually what's going on. But there there is this whole increased notion, and this is very much tied to the whole you know, censorship in society. Basically, uh, society can't critically think. Critically thinking is bad anyway because it's white supremacy. So what we need is people unable to be critical thinkers. Therefore, they have to be able to accept whatever we tell them. And if anything opposes that, then they're so vulnerable and unable to digest it. And then this plays over into, into curriculum. I mean, this is, you know, the fashioning and forming of people to basically only be able to think one way without without parents being able to to uh, be a legitimate alternative. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that that that's actually a really important point in there for parents that if you have your kids in public schools, make sure you have access to the curriculum and take a look at it. It is not just access. Make sure you do take a look at it. That's extremely important. But even there, I, I've seen, I don't know how many videos of people who are, you know, who are teachers who are saying things like, and, and they record this, where they're saying things like, yeah, you know, we're not allowed to teach this, but I'm putting it in the curriculum anyway. Right. <laughs> You know, so you so you you got to watch not just what the formal curriculum is, but what the informal curriculum is. And the most important way to do that is to keep talking to your kids. Yeah. The problems, uh, you know, related to this are, are I think, uh, important to note. One of the one of the problems, of course, is that um, oftentimes when uh, a, a parent is uh, proactive and, you know, gets into kind of the inner workings of a school and, and examines the curriculum, they're just seen as a kind of passing um, sort of annoyance. You know, you can just kind of wait it out. You know, when Johnny, the, the kid that that mother or father, you know, uh, is connected to, when Johnny moves on to the next grade or moves on to the next school, then we won't have to worry about that person anymore. And that's one of the problems that we have when we're, when we're dealing with bureaucracy, generally speaking, they have the ability to kind of wait it out. Furthermore, there is a kind of us and them mindset that's often in, in play um, where you have uh, teachers who stick together, even though they know that some of them are, some of their colleagues are, are really terrible. Um, and then, you know, there's just the, the fact that there is a kind of, um, there has been a kind of hostile takeover by uh, the left when it comes to uh, institutions, generally speaking, but especially institutions of, uh, you know, when it comes to education, you know, educational institutions. I remember when I was involved in the Parents' uh, Rights Initiative in Massachusetts that was uh, sponsored by Mass Resistance. That was a great name for an organization. And it exists to this day, by the way. My old friend, Brian Kamaker, who is a, a, a conservative Jewish uh uh, activist, it, he recruited me to be involved in this effort. And I, so I was involved in it uh, to the point where I was actually sitting in it, uh, Senate hearings in the, you know, on Beacon Hill in Massachusetts and, and listening to um, the uh, administrators of public schools defending their right to uh, undermine a parent's interests. And uh, actually, you know, they'd come right up and say that my job is to actually um, essentially steal away this kid from the influence of, of, of parents yeah. that are deemed by educators as benighted or, 
you know, uh, corrupt or morally suspect or what have you. So <laughs> they, they view themselves as uh, saviors. Um, and the way what they're trying to save the kids from is the parents. <laughs> anyway. Well, it's, well, it's, well, it's, well, it's interesting. I mean, you, we even think, you know, we can go back to any any i mean i think all of us will will have experienced to some degree the way in which especially around middle school teenage years there's almost this acceptance in education that that children are going to be you know they're going to rebel right they're going to have to get their identity through negating basically you know the the social norms or the identity of their parents and and everything else and that is not that that is a byproduct of ideological commitments. That is not a universal. Um, my wife grew up in Colombia. They didn't have rebellious teen years. Yeah, they had places at which they're going to try things and experiment with things in life. But it wasn't a rebellious against the family, right? They knew they were a part of the family. That family was a support. And the extended, you know, their, their role was not to kind of create an identity ripped apart from it. It was it was to kind of find your your kind of your place in it and and carry it, you know, your own way. Where here we we almost we almost have the acceptance, the kind of this enlightenment, anti authority that you know we're not going to be determined by anything, not even parental lineage, right? Um, not even heritage, really. Um, and so that kind of has been has been seeped into to our educational veins. And so now the next level is if that just is it's assumed across the board at younger and younger and younger ages, especially, you know, going back to Plato's whole notion uh, in, in the Republic of basically if you want to get them, get them before 10. Right. Um, that's when the elites can basically fashion them their way. After that, they're kind of useless. And we've kind of embraced that. Another part of this, too, is the the facade of diversity. So oftentimes this is uh, this approach is uh, uh, defended or uh, promoted with the uh, with the trappings of, you know, we want to be accepting and we want to um, celebrate, you know, the various, you know, cultures that we find in our community. But the problem with that, what, I'm, what I mean is, is that. It's generally the case, and I've seen this again and again, that those ethnic groups which promote family solidarity, the respect of authority, uh, applying oneself to one's studies, they succeed. I don't care what part of the world they're coming from, but they succeed. What, what these public educators seem to be interested in celebrating is not achievement, but a kind of Dionysian uh, yeah. sort of – a frenzy uh, or giving oneself over to irrational passions uh, yeah. and calling those things good. Uh, as, as case in point, if you take a look at the uh, income for different ethnic groups in the United States, the highest income on average are Indian Americans. Right. Okay. Seven out of the top eight income groups are non-white. Right. Yeah. Um, there, there's something going on here that the CRT people are unable to account for, so they just sort of write it off. Right. Um, yeah. the, the, the issue ends up being not – in America, you know, the guy named Wilfred Riley that you should really look up, he's a professor uh, who specializes in – looking at the data behind various social claims. And, you know, he's an African-American. He's at a historically black college. And uh, the, the, the amount of material he masses that puts a lie to a lot of this stuff is really, is really staggering. And his point is exactly the same as the one you're making. You know, the, the, uh, the cultures that emphasize family, that emphasize hard work, that emphasize education – get ahead it doesn't matter what part of the world they're from right yeah and so, you know Ghanaians, nigerians nigerians right. are the highest educated people in america on average yeah i've, I've had many uh exp you know many uh, uh opportunities to get to know uh african immigrants to the united states and uh and they've done really well um mm -hmm. yeah because of the things that you're bringing out so my wife who teaches piano and she's had you know, hundreds of piano students over the last 30 years. And uh, the immigrants, uh, almost without fail, 
everywhere, you know, people, they're coming from, from India, China, Korea, Africa, doesn't matter. Uh, they tend to do a lot better than the American kids, regardless of what, you know, ethnic background that they're coming from. Uh, and that's because of the things we just talked about. Um, you know, some of the, you know, one of the reasons why the Indians do so well is because of huge paternal involvement. I'm talking about the fathers. Mm-hmm. I, remember, I remember my wife had this one student who, when, when she would come and, uh, you know, get her lesson, her father would stand right at the piano the entire time <laughs> and listening to everything my wife told uh, you know, her student, this uh, young girl. And, and my wife knew that when that girl went home, he, she would be reminded by her father <laughs> of everything my wife that had said, <laughs> and that girl, you know, uh, excelled. Now, obviously, yeah. there was a there was a lot of uh, pressure there, but it mm-hmm. was also compensated with a lot of attention and a lot of uh, love, and and uh, you know, those kids have all done really well. That you know, we've seen them grow into adulthood again and again and again. Well, I think that's the that's the key there too. I mean, it, it, this is theologically the the same point. I mean, when, if duty for duty's sake, I get that, but it's because it's wrapped up in what's good for us, out of love, out of the right kind of love, not soft feelings, but the kind of love that is hard pressed to reality. Um, that you're going to have to face reality. Reality, it, you're not going to be able to escape it. But it is through this which which you do you order things this way. The delight delight and and your fulfillment comes through it i mean we, we see it over and over it's the point of the commands right it's not they're not burdensome <laughs> right um when you realize that their duties wrapped in love um delight and we delight in them why you delight in it in and in, in, in wanting to please your your parents who you know that the reason they have it there is not because they're just wanting to impose their will on you there are examples of that um, but when it is wrapped in in that kind of that you truly want to honor them because, you know, they want you to do your best because they know that's a good for you. That's a totally different thing. And it's similar to, you know, obeying Christ. Right. We know we know his love for us. Therefore, we know that trial and doing things the right way um, is, is something we can delight in. So I'd like to take this in, in yet another direction. I'd like to, to reflect a little bit on the role of Christian colleges in the training of public educators. I want you to know I am totally, uh, well, I'm very disappointed in the performance of Christian colleges in this regard. My experience, and I've been involved in Christian higher education for 30 years in different capacities. I'm uh, the, the vice president of the Academy of Philosophy and Letters. I'm on the board of a college, New St. Andrews. I, I, and I've taught in Christian colleges. Glenn, you have to, you know, uh, you know, you know, Tom, you have what I have witnessed is not so much uh, salt and light being brought to public education by Christian colleges. Uh, when it comes to teacher training, I don't see confidence. I see capitulation again and again. I see, uh, those departments of education at Christian colleges becoming the mouthpieces or just parroting uh, kind of secular uh, pseudo-intellectual fads in the Mm -hmm. Christian environment and trying to find ways to baptize them, sort of to reconcile the nonsense with the Christian faith. Have you guys witnessed the same thing? Well, the part, yeah. oh, go ahead, Glenn. part of that is that um, they really, you know, they're, they're looking at practical issues like accreditation. You know, we have to keep our accreditation. We have to be able to keep placing our students in public schools so that they can be certified, you know, student teaching and such. And as a result, their argument is we need to dance to their tune. You know, so so there's there is a real, you know, there, there's a real there, there's pressure here. If you're yeah. preparing teachers for public school, you got to do it. And whether or not they should do it, it doesn't really enter the equation. It's we have to jump through these hoops. Now, of course, the problem then becomes that 
they they justify doing this not just simply on pragmatic grounds. You know, they don't tell the students, okay, this is what you need to know. This is what you need to know to get into the schools. It's not true because, you know, we've got all these, the, the, this is the way you should be thinking about it. It's not the way they do it in the schools. You still have to know this stuff, though, in order to go in. They don't do that. They they find ways to justify teaching this stuff that is just simply, you know, frankly, anti-Christian in many cases. Yeah, yeah. that's the disappointing thing. I know if, if, if I had the sense that they had the savvy to kind of, uh, kind of uh, do what needed to be done to get in with the with the note with the sort of longer term goal of actually um, being a source of uh, renewal and uh, uh, reform. <laughs> uh, oh, come on, use the word subversion. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, well, I subvert the subverters. Well, <laughs> well, that's, that's what I, say. I mean, I, I remember some years back. Uh, L. Gregory Jones, who used to be the dean at Duke Divinity, he wrote an interesting book called um, Something to Do with Forgiveness, The Cost of Forgiveness. And one of the things he notes in the book is that basically the therapeutic notion of forgiveness has entered the, the, the church in, in its counseling, which has a different anthropology, view of the human, their nature, and then different ends for which the human is here. And so you can't just take the findings of a psychology built on a whole different understanding of the human being and human purposes, and then baptize it. And see, this is exactly what I've been, and we've been doing on the show, so what the early church didn't do with when it confronted philosophy. What it first said was philosophy is no, that's the wisdom of the world. Then what it did is it took the frame and built the, 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 the metaphysical vision on the incarnation and the Trinity and then once they had that in place, then they said yes, right? And what we've done is we've detached ourselves from that rich vision so much that we don't know how to do that in our fields of expertise. I mean, I see people teaching psychology on the seminary level um, who should have had enough theological education at this point, but all they're just doing is, is you know, again, re basically all the theories, but now applied to the church, Right. Um, and they're not even questioning whether or not, you know, you know, unless it's just obvious where there is a, a kind of distorted picture in the in the the kind of, you know, vision of education or psychology they're using. I mean, but other than that, they don't really even think about it. They just, oh, OK, systems theory. OK, we can just apply that to the church and see what we can illumine. Right. right? right. Um, they don't. Yeah. That rigor is gone. Yeah, I, I, I'm at a place now where I think the institutions uh, across our society uh, are in crisis, and I think people know it. Uh, yeah. I don't think anybody is. I mean, Richard Dreyfus of all people is like becoming an alarmist. <laughs> you know, well, yeah. warning about the end of the world and stuff. Yeah, I, 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 I know when when Robert Kennedy. Is, is yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, sounding, sounding. That's so not insane. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> when you have when you have more and more people like Naomi Wolf and all of these people, yeah. you know, you know, sounding the alarm. You know, you're at a place. You're at a you're at a, you're at a uh, kind of a uh, a, a moment. It, uh, well, a crisis, a time yeah. for judgment, which is you know where we get the, the word crisis, credo. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in light of that. Will we be able to rise to the occasion? I have very, very little confidence in uh, the Christian College Coalition to do that. I have very little confidence in what you know Carl Truman has, uh, you know, uh, christened Big Eba <laughs> to do that. I have zero. Was confidence. that his term? Yeah, he inv he coined it. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Christianity Today is a joke. Um, we're, well, and, and a lot of it, I mean, I mean the, 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 you don't even know what really fits in under evangelical anymore. I mean, it, it, maybe maybe we, I mean, there was always a problem of defining it. I, I mean, you even take someone like John Stott or something, I mean, you could probably get it down to the kind of core rudiments of the gospel, right? A commitment to these things. Well, um, actually, there is a definition that's been used among his, um, historians of Christianity on this. Um, yeah. It's... Uh, Biblicism, crucicentrism, conversionism, and social action. 
Yeah. So you're talking a very reductive set of of terms, which, you know, I, most of those, the way they understand them, and I understand myself committed fully to the evangel, um, you know, you know um, but that wouldn't be how I defined it. That kind of, you know, and biblicism now and what it means to be scriptural, it, it, again, it, it has become so relativized. Yeah, every, that, everybody from Beth Moore to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, you yeah. know, J, and Arush Dooney say, claim, claim, claim to be uh, supported by the Bible. <laughs> yeah. You know, so how do we sort this all out? So we, and well, the good, you know, again, it's, it takes, <laughs> it's not a, it's not, not a quick fix. <laughs> That's the way God works this out. Um, but we've been here before um, and maybe we took some wrong directions. That's why we needed, you know, reform. Um, but I mean, the church confronted a lot of this stuff very early on. It started to get a radical plurality of doctrinal visions. Um, and, and I think, I think one of the things you'll see and nobody likes to talk about because we love to kind of say, okay, yeah, we, we all affirm the creed. I think a lot of us actually don't affirm the creed. Mm-hmm. I don't think we do really draw upon the, a rigorous reading of scripture in light of its, its core loci, right? Um, uh, its core doctrinal truths. And so because of that, we can baptize anything and say, oh, this, is, this, this can be a scriptural reading. And one of the ways we do it um, even though there, it is significant to have the grammatical and the historical in there. But we can relativize almost any passage with that because we cannot know comprehensibly what happened when. So we can import any kind of significance at a certain time just to the best, most reliable way that makes sense to us now. Um, and so, that you know, the, the earliest church didn't have access to much of that. And yet it still found those core doctrines central to to reading that. And so why do I say that? It's because that doctrinal groundwork was the content that gave the foundation to the ethical vision, moral orthodoxy in the in the church, its commitment to family the way it did, its commitment to, um, you know, and, and again, a lot of this had to spell out over time and we still wrestle with it, you know, now, the, you know, how important to the image of God, both being embodied male and female is, right? Um, the, these kinds of things. But if we don't have that part shared, if we just say, oh, we all affirm orthodoxy, but we're not seeing how our exegesis and our doctrines um, work out together to underwrite our moral claims, then, yeah, we're going to be stuck with this relativism. Um, so so I'd, I'd like to uh, kind of, as we wrap this up, uh, bring this home in a couple of ways. Uh, to our audience, I'd like to say a couple of things that might seem to contradict each other, but I don't think they do. The first thing is homeschool. Uh, start classical schools. Come out of them, my people. <laughs> In other, words, in other words, it's time to to abandon these institutions when it comes to your kids because uh, they're almost irredeemable. And th- this brings me to the second point. The reason why they're almost irredeemable is because they're not in the direct uh, or they, they're not easy to or it, I'm going to put it even more strongly. It's almost impossible for local communities to control this. So let's say you come from the most conservative Bible believing, uh, you know, city in America or town in America. Well, I want you to know that your teachers don't really care what you think. Uh, and your certainly your school administrators don't. What they're doing is they're listening to the dictates that come down from on high from the teachers association and the department of education and all of the credentialing institutions that give them you know, the, uh, the letters behind their names that help them to get raises every year and stuff like that. And they're looking to build their little empires and please, uh, people very, very far away from you. So we need to get a lot more savvy when we do call these institutions to account. It's not going to be enough to just go to the local board meeting. Yeah, that'll, that'll provide some great, uh, material, for you know, social media and maybe local politicians who have a conservative bent to, to uh, get some votes, but we're up against a leviathan that is uh, corrupting our co- Christian colleges uh, as well as our local schools, and we need to speak out. We need to vote. We need to show up at these different uh, uh, 
in these different forums, because there are a lot of kids out there, uh, you know, when we look at this particular uh, article, uh, Don't Spare the Rod, you know, there's a lot of attention given to the to the few kids who are uh, tormenting all the other kids. But there are a lot of kids who are getting tormented and uh, are being uh, uh, who are discouraged and who are not learning. And we need to do something for those kids. Um, I think that things that we could provide, it, you know, in our churches would be great yeah. to supplement the education or the lack of education or to, to fill in the blanks for what they're not getting. But also we need to, we need to be the voice in the wilderness. Uh, we need to be the prophetic voice that actually points the finger and condemns what's going on uh, yeah. strongly. I'm sick and tired of these winsome cr- characters who think that we should just be the water boys of culture and just go along, around all the time and, you know, uh, you know, in, in, uh, looking for ways to, to legitimize yeah. this nonsense. This is the voice of the person that uh, has experienced this <laughs> stuff firsthand from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, don't hold back. Tell us what's real. <laughs> anyway, so uh, why don't we wrap it up with that? Uh, <laughs> thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast. If you enjoy our show, great. If you don't, why are you listening? <laughs> having fun, having fun. <laughs> there, there, are, there are a few out there. I've noticed. Spend I've noticed. Their days. <laughs> Spend their days. <laughs> that's, that's right, the pedants. Anyway, uh, if you would like to support us, you can go to Patreon. We have a link uh, to our Patreon account. We really do appreciate the people who do support the show and help us pay the bills. And uh, I think this show will be out uh, before we are in uh, Memphis at the PCA General Assembly. That's coming together nicely. We're going to have Doug Grotheist and uh, George Grant as special guests for our live shows. And we'll let you know a little more about those uh, here in the near future. Anyway, bye-bye. The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. If you like this podcast, you might enjoy another of our podcasts, The Good Life Podcast, featuring Matt Carpenter interviewing experts in their field about how their work contributes to the good life.